Welcome to video four of the completeness proof in propositional logic. In this video, we're going to be using some things that we've proven in the past three videos. So if you need this for a course or you're just tuning in for this, if you don't know the stuff in the previous videos or you see a theorem in here that you're saying, hey, where did that come from? Check the previous three videos because it'll be in there. Other than that, uh, hopefully you're still following along. This stuff gets a little bit crazier. We're talking about the consistency lemma, and we're saying that every set of sentences that is maximally consistent is going to be semantically consistent or truth functionally consistent. But we can't quite prove this yet. We're going to prove this theorem 1.8 in the next video. Instead, we have to prove some subproofs that help prove the consistency lemma. So here's one. If gamma proves alpha and gamma prime is a maximally consistent superset of gamma, then alpha is going to be a member of gamma plus, which is the same thing as saying that gamma plus is going to prove alpha. So here's some things. We're going to assume that gamma proves alpha, and of course gamma plus is going to be a maximally consistent superset of gamma. So by derivability, we know that if gamma proves alpha, then the maximally consistent superset of that is also going to prove alpha. So this is one of our previous theorems right here and now we're going to do something crazy. Let's just assume that gamma plus is not going to prove alpha. So I guess what we'll say to keep it consistent, we're going to say that alpha is not a member of gamma. So this symbol right here says not a member. And alpha is a member of gamma is the same thing as saying alpha. Then we have this little epsilon here, and that just is a member. So is a member. You might have seen this notation before in one of the previous videos. I honestly can't remember, so I shall just reintroduce it. So we're going to assume that alpha is not a member of this gamma. So by definition of consistency here, this is going to say that gamma plus with alpha is going to be inconsistent. And one of the first theorems we proved showed that if gamma and some atom alpha prove an inconsistency, then gamma plus is going to prove not alpha. So now here we have a contradiction. So one of our assumptions is wrong. Therefore, we're going to say that this assumption here is wrong. This is the thing causing the contradiction. Therefore, alpha must be a member of the maximally consistent set gamma plus. So that is the proof of theorem 1.9. Uh, it's a proof by contradiction, so you assume something that you think is going to cause a contradiction, you get one, and then you can prove, you can claim the opposite of what happens. It's a very good technique. So that's theorem 1.9. Uh, that's one of two. The next one we have to do is very long, so this is going to be fun. 1.10. If gamma plus is maximally consistent in PL, and alpha and beta are sentences, then, well, here's the fun stuff. We have five conditions. We say that not alpha is a member of gamma plus if gamma plus, actually I should say this differently, if alpha is not a member of gamma plus, we can say that alpha and beta are in gamma plus if alpha is in gamma plus and beta is in gamma plus. So you can kind of see where we're going here. We're doing uh, some semantics. Uh, alpha or beta is going to be in gamma plus if alpha is in gamma plus or beta is in gamma plus. There's really no surprises so far. And of course, then we're going to say alpha arrow beta is in gamma plus if, and we have two conditions here, either alpha is not in gamma plus, or 
beta is in gamma plus. If you remember the truth tables, uh, A arrow B is true if A is false or B is true. So we're just reflecting that here. And of course we have the biconditional of alpha and beta is going to be in gamma plus if, well, we have two conditions here. We say alpha is in gamma plus and beta is in gamma plus or alpha is not in gamma plus and beta is not in gamma plus. So there you have it. Here are five things that we need to prove. Yeah, I said we need to prove that. And it's a little crazy. So here's what we're going to do. Proof of A. We're going to assume that not alpha is a member of gamma plus. So this is the same thing as saying that alpha is not a member of gamma plus because let's assume that alpha was a member of gamma plus. Well, then we'd have that gamma plus can prove alpha and gamma plus can prove not alpha. Therefore, we get a contradiction. So we then get this result by contradiction. So we know that alpha cannot be a member of gamma plus. Uh, some books have it a little bit differently by this proof, but this really is sufficient. <laughs> In fact, if we take a look at the definition, um, if it's maximally consistent, then there, you know, this is how it goes. Proof of B, which states that um, if alpha and beta are in gamma plus, then either, I mean, then alpha is in gamma plus and B is in gamma plus. So here's something. We have um, alpha is in gamma plus. We're going to assume these things. Actually, we're going to assume that alpha and beta is in gamma plus. And we know here that then we get alpha and beta. We can prove alpha. And if we get alpha and beta, we can prove beta. So we know from this that, well, I should write one more step here, that gamma plus can then prove alpha and beta, and then we can get two cases from it. And this implies that alpha is going to be in gamma plus, and this implies that beta is going to be in gamma plus. So we have our two conditions there, and you can do a little bit more with uh, the definition. You can mess things around, but we've proven B, essentially. Uh, C is the alpha or beta. So we have alpha or beta is in gamma. And this one is a little bit uh, trickier if you don't know exactly what you're doing. So... What we want to say is, well, gamma can prove, or gamma plus can prove, alpha or beta. So the, the definition we want is alpha is in gamma plus, or beta is in gamma plus. So I guess what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, suppose alpha is not a member of gamma plus, and beta is not a member of gamma plus, which means that gamma plus is going to prove not alpha and gamma plus is going to prove not beta and what you have here is you have a little bit of a contradiction since you know that gamma plus proves alpha or beta and we know from this that at least one of them has to be true in fact we can take these two here gamma plus proves not alpha and gamma plus proves alpha or beta and then we can prove that then, well, gamma plus is going to prove beta. And here, we get a contradiction. So you have to do this both ways to be uh, fully in depth with this proof. I'm not going to write both ways. But again, if you remember, this is the rule for disjunctive syllogism. You have alpha or beta, not beta proves alpha. So we're using this rule. And you have to do it both ways. So you also have to prove... Um, alpha or beta, not alpha proves beta, 
and then you're good to go. But that is another proof that this right here is going to be wrong. So that means that at least one of them has to be in there, which is this lovely definition here. Uh, proof of D is alpha arrow beta. Okay, this is also a, a nice one here. So we assume that P arrow, what am I doing with P's? Alpha arrow beta is going to be in the maximal set. And if, well, if we say that alpha is not in gamma, then this is still going to be true. So obviously it follows that this definition, alpha is not in gamma plus or beta is in gamma plus. And this is case one. So we assume this and while that is obvious, it brings us to our thing here. And case two, what we're going to do here is something perhaps, I don't know, a little confusing. We're going to say, well, what if alpha is in gamma plus? Well, then it's going to imply that, well, we have gamma plus proves alpha. We have gamma plus is going to prove alpha arrow beta. Therefore, gamma plus is going to prove beta. So then it follows in this circumstance that this definition also holds. So, I kind of lied when I said it was tricky, but I'm thinking, hey, if you don't know where to go, it's going to be a little bit tricky to figure out what to do. So, in either case, this is going to be true. So, proof of E is the biconditional, which is not so fun. You say alpha, beta isn't gamma, plus, so... So what we're going to do is we're going to say that alpha is a member of gamma plus and beta is a member of gamma plus. And of course, then we can get a proof from alpha to beta and we can get a proof from beta to alpha. So we're going to get the definition that alpha is gamma, alpha is in gamma plus and beta is in gamma plus or the other way around. In fact, I think even at this point in time, I am actually going to just leave this one as an exercise because I think this is a good time for you to actually do one because A, I've just shown you four to the five ones, so I think you're good enough to do this on your own. And uh, quite frankly also, it's, it's kind of useless to prove this one because you can just use the definition of the arrow and conjunction to get this if you wanted to, and you could just sort of assume that because both of those are true that this one is also true. So it's not exactly necessary. So we're going to use these results to prove completeness, or not completeness, Theorem 1.8 in the next video. And we're going to use Theorem 1.8 to prove Theorem 1.2, which will prove completeness. And as a reminder of Theorem 1.8, this says that every set of sentences in PL that is maximally consistent is truth functionally consistent. So we did the truth functional part here. This is uh, some of the truth functional part, because as you can see, all these things right here, this is our semantics. These are not proofs, these are our semantics. So we're going to use this to prove Theorem 1.8, and we'll come back with a full proof of completeness finally finished in the next video.